on this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. Being a tracker pretty much full time, I follow around animals and I teach people how to follow around animals. One of the crucial subsistence strategies for people until very recently. And then it kind of appears to me to fade back, except in Africa where you can still have a full time job as a tracker. Trackers slash hunters are our original scientists. When I first heard the term cyber tracker, I thought this was like an online program. And then seeing the rigor of it, I get really under stood for the first time. And I ended up following her trail, which turned into a trail with coyotes crossing it. And then it turned into a blood trail. And then I found her carcass. More scientists will recognize this as a valid tool in the toolbox of skills that they can provide to their students and their researchers. Episode 114 of the Wild Fed Podcast, Way of the Cyber Tracker with Kersey Lawrence, is brought to you by Sir Thrival. Sir Thrival's just released a brand new energy drink mix called Biomatrix. It's a natural, water soluble, powdered energy drink mix based on an energizing concentrate of yerba mate. With a refreshing iced tea like flavor and bright citrus notes, it gives you a nice lift without the jitters of many pre workout formulas. And it supports your natural energy levels with a custom blend of amino acids and adaptogenic herbs like schizandra, goji berry, and rhodiola. If you're looking for a natural energy boost that won't leave you feeling wired, spun out, or depleted, check out Biomatrix at surthrival.com. While you're there, take a look at the entire product line. As we head into winter, now's a great time to pick up a bottle of Sir Thrival's Daylight Concentrate, a vitamin D3 supplement like no other. Learn more at SirThrival.com where the coupon code WILDFED always gets you 5% off your order. Sir Thrival, why just survive when you can thrive? If you still haven't seen season one of the Wild Fed TV show, you can now stream all 10 episodes on demand at MyOutdoorTV.com. MyOutdoorTV.com is Outdoor Channel's premium online subscription service. They host thousands of episodes of hunting and fishing content, making this a great subscription service for anyone interested in the outdoors. But if you just want to see Wild Fed, grab yourself a free trial subscription and then check out all 10 episodes at no charge. If you decide to keep it, it's just $9.99 a month. We're currently in production for season two of Wild Fed, which is shaping up to be an awesome season of new episodes, and they'll start premiering on the Outdoor Channel in 2022. Hey, thanks again for all your incredible support. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to The Wild Fed Podcast, a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed. Food is all around you. Today's guest is senior cyber tracker Kersey Lawrence. If you've been listening to the show for a while, you've heard me speak to a few skilled trackers in past episodes. This skill of studying, identifying, and ultimately tracking and trailing animals was most likely fundamental to the development of the modern human brain and perhaps even to language itself. At one time, this skill would have been nearly universal amongst humans. But of course, in our modern era, it's atrophied to the point that most of us can't identify the tracks of the native wildlife around us, no less interpret them. Now, modern hunters are a bit of an exception. Most of us are aware of the track patterns of the animals we pursue, and we use those tracks, albeit in a rudimentary way, to locate our quarry. That kind of tracking is a bit like learning an alphabet or maybe even reading a few monosyllabic words. What I'm talking with Kersey about today is different. It's more akin to reading sentences, paragraphs, and ultimately books of knowledge about how animals have used the landscape in the recent past and potentially will in the future too. There are places and peoples in the world where this skill is still alive, part of an unbroken lineage that stretches back into the deepest recesses of human antiquity. And there are also folks for whom this field of study came later in life, but who've developed it into a contemporary art form and culture, who've codified it, and who are ensuring it doesn't blink out of existence the way so much of our ancestral skills and technologies have. Kersey has a foot in both worlds. She lives part-time and works alongside trackers in Africa who come from communities where tracking is still practiced the way it has always been, places where the practice of this art was never generationally interrupted. But she also lives part-time here in the U.S. where she teaches tracking to folks whose lineage forgot the art of tracking long ago. Kersey's the first woman to ever earn the title of senior tracker in the internationally renowned cyber tracker system. 
Today, she's going to tell us what Cyber Tracker is and about the art of tracking. She's done the deep dive, and she's going to introduce us to something our ancestors forgot long ago, and maybe even invite us to pick it up where those distant relatives left off. To not just follow in their footsteps, but to follow their footsteps themselves. Kersey Lawrence, PhD. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. Is it? I'm, it's my pleasure to have you here. You are uh, quite an accomplished character and seems like you live a very rich life. And I'm very excited to hear a little bit about it today. So uh, thanks for joining us. Um, I first learned about you uh, through some mutual friends who were teaching an online hunting course. And I'm kind of curious how you were involved in all that. Um, yeah, I think that it's just through community, you know, like the tracking community is kind of small, just like the wilderness community, um, you know, wilderness schools and nature connection and all things like that. And it's just through friends of friends of friends that, you know, we reach out and we just try to help each other. And that's exactly what happened there. A friend of mine, you know, knew the people up there in Canada that were putting together this online uh, hunting course to try and help introduce more people to hunting. And they were searching around for women who were hunters. And I've hunted previously. I haven't hunted in the past few years because I've been busy traveling. Um, and, uh, you know, I, but I'll probably get back to that at some point. And so they reached out to me and I sort of started filling in as the tracking component, ah. the tracking mentor for the course. Tell us a little bit about your uh, what your work is, what you do currently, and then I'd like to get in a little bit to the backstory. But you've turned tracking into uh, much more than a hobby. It seems like it's a, it's a huge part of what you do. It's everything that I do. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm I'm really fortunate, and um, tra being a tracker pretty much full-time, a teacher of tracking, a practitioner of tracking, you know, a mentor of tracking, just somebody who tracks, uh, requires me to be extremely flexible, requires me to pivot a lot, uh, you know. So when you ask me what I do, that kind of depends on any given day. And of course, you know, the whole COVID thing has changed that model many times. Um, so I travel around the world and I teach people tracking and I spend on average, half the year in the U.S. and half the year in South Africa, and then travel to places like Europe or Northern Africa, Central Africa, in between, and um, teach tracking there with my partner, Lee Guttridge. And, uh, you know, it just really depends on where we are and, you know, what we're called to do. Sometimes it's more ecological linking through tracking. Sometimes it's the actual physical practice of identifying tracks and signs. Sometimes it's, you know, creating the larger stories that are involved by teaching people how to trail animals to follow and find them, which has implications for anti-poaching and also for the hunting community and, you know, just people who want to get out there and I, I say hunting, that includes hunting with cameras, you know, I mean, wildlife photography is huge. And um, so I basically just pivot to, you know, we have a number of different programs that we do, including study abroad programs where we bring groups to South Africa and teach them tracking. We go to indigenous communities. We just came from the Congo in April, where we were teaching some entry level field guides in Garamba National Park, where they hadn't had field guides or trackers in many Many, many years. Um, so they're trying to reopen tourism to that area. And, you know, so we went there and, and introduced uh, guiding, reintroduced guiding, I should say, to that environment and tracking to that environment. Um, and then just, you know, tracking courses. I just came from one in Wisconsin where it was absolutely amazing. We, uh, <laughs> we landed and we hadn't even gotten to our starting point yet. We were still driving in on the back roads. And I stopped and I said, is that elk? I had looked up and there in the road in the distance was something that looked like a human standing there. And I said, is that elk? And the people in the car with me looked and they said, not sure. And I got out my binoculars and I looked and there were nine elk standing in the road. <laughs> And that, so we had the beginning of our trail 
And we just, we continued to follow this past week. We followed elk trails. We followed wolves hunting deer and put that story wow. together. We followed coyotes the next day hunting deer and their trails intersected with fisher trails. And we trailed deer all over the place, which I firmly tell people, if you can trail deer, you can trail anything because they are just old spaghetti legs, you know, like they can go anywhere. <laughs> they, <laughs> Yeah. They can go underneath things. They go over things, you know, like you just wouldn't imagine where deer can go. And uh, you really have to follow their trail, you know, with much with other animals, you can get a more linear sense of perspective. But with deer, they tend to, you know, be in small areas and they go in circles and they're feeding and they're coming together and they're splitting apart. And it's just, yeah, it's amazing. And um so that's what I do mostly. I follow around animals and I teach people how to follow around animals. Well, I want to add a couple things that I'm I'm looking at um, your bio, and so I want I just want to touch on these two things. And I sort of playfully, you know, brought up your PhD when I introduced you because your PhD is on tracking, right? Trackers and tracking. And then you also are the first woman to have earned the title of senior tracker in the cyber tracker system. So could you tell us like maybe first a little bit about your PhD and how that came together? Uh, and then also let people know what cyber tracker is who aren't familiar and uh, what se a senior tracker designation in that means as well. Yes. So geez, those are long answers. <laughs> <laughs> really so long. yeah, my PhD, um, I feel like a lot of things that happened, have happened in my life are sort of accidental and including me even going to college. I don't know that anybody ever expected me to go to college. My family were pretty poor and I was the youngest of four children, the only girl. And um, so I grew up always in the woods, you know, like sort of doing all the things that my older brothers did. And um, I actually went the day after I graduated from high school, I got on a plane with a suitcase and I flew out to California and I spent a year vagabonding around and surfing. <laughs> cool. And right. then, yeah. And then um, I came back during the same week that my oldest brother had gotten out of the Navy and returned home. And we were basically in our parents' house, you know, as adults, young adults. And we were going to the gym together just because we didn't have jobs and we didn't have anything else at the moment we were looking and one day he said to me um i i want to stop at this college on the way back from the gym and apply do you mind if we go there and i said not at all and i walked in with him and he filled out the application and the lady at the desk said do you want to fill out one too <laughs> and i was like okay <laughs> and so I filled out the application and I got admitted and I got financial aid and I started on this um, career where, you know, I've been a lifelong learner and I just love learning in any capacity. And so getting to choose the courses that I took, like I took a course on Shakespeare and I took a course on anatomy and physiology where we had to learn all the bones of the skull in one night. And it was like getting a, these things accomplished made me recognize what I hadn't recognized in high school was that I could do it and that it could be interesting and that teachers could be fun and that they mm. could care about what you, you know, who you were and what you wanted to learn. And um, so I just kept going from there. And, I, you know, I always had to work. I always had to pay my own way. So college was a, was a much longer process for me than for many other people who were able to take out loans or wanted to take out loans, I should say. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to pay for it. Bravo. And I did. Yeah. So, um, so I don't have any debt, you know, hanging over my head from that. I just, you know, i worked a lot of different jobs during my career and um, just kept going and going and going. And I just really enjoyed the learning so much that I just kept going, you know, like, and it's been a lifelong career alongside of learning, you know, the dirt time in the field because I go back and forth from academia to actual field time. Right. And, you know, so I wound up getting this PhD and um, 
you know, like I said, I think it's just a series of following my interests and, you know, like being fortunate and having, you know, certain accidents happen along the way. And my PhD, I think was probably three or more PhDs wrapped up into one <laughs> because, because I'm just so interested in so many different things. And it has aspects of ecology and anthropology and education. And, you know, it just, it, it covers so much. So I probably could have split it up into three different PhDs, but I decided to just, you know, wrap it all into one. And I'm working on getting that published separately as articles. But um, so the first chapter of my PhD, the first content chapter has to do with a review of the literature that's been published in science where tracked track-based data has been collected and whether or not the researchers publishing that science have included a metric of the skill of their observers. So what is the skill level of the person that they have sent out there to collect their data? Because to me in science, that's integral to knowing the quality of your results, mm -hmm. you know? So garbage in equals garbage out. If you have garbage data, if you don't know the skill level of your observers, how do you know the quality of your data? And I ended up reviewing, I can't remember the exact number, but it was over 400 papers that I included. And I think only 11 of them wound up having a clear metric of the observer re reliability. And many of those were Mark Elbrock's papers who in oh, his no data, <laughs> yeah, of course in they his, were. yeah, well, in his data collection, very often he states in the papers that he's a part of, or that his you know, whatever team he's working with states that all observers were cyber tracker level three certified or above, you know, so that helps you to know the quality of the data that's collected there. So you're saying like, um, I just want to clarify for people listening. So when you're looking at a, a wildlife study, let's say, um, let's say it's going to be used for management purposes or, or determining population density or something like that. And they're relying on tracks that they found, we need to know in some way what the skill level is of the observer because they might be calling Fisher Tracks raccoon accidentally and we wouldn't know that the data was off, which could lead to bad management decisions down the road, something like that. Absolutely. That's exactly 100% why we need to know. And mm -hmm. it's not just tracks, you know, it's signs that animals leave behind. Scat, feces, poop, you know, that is something that a lot of researchers study because, you know, you can find it out in the environment and it's supposed to be identifiable. And if you look at any of the field guides, they describe classic scat. Like this is the classic <laughs> right. deer scat and this is the classic mm -hmm. bobcat scat. And this is how you tell it apart from fox scat or coyote scat. But is it really? I mean, not to be gross or anything, but if you think about your own diet and your own health, I imagine your scat varies over time. <laughs> day to day. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, and the same thing happens with animals, right? And so, yes, okay, we can draw certain tendencies like a classic bobcat scat tends to have these characteristics. But if you're going out in the field and you don't even know that, you know, and you're collecting scats. Like there's one paper that I cite in my dissertation where they were collecting, I think it was in England, they were collecting mink scats for a project and they ended up DNA testing them after their paper had come out. And they found out that all of the scats that they had collected, not like 80% of them or 90% <laughs> of them, but all, all of them were not, were not mink scats, oh, no. you know? Oh, no. And I'm not saying that, that, you know, we cannot have a high level of um, reliability, but I'm saying that it's important that we know the level of reliability. Right. Now, you that's know? also had, I guess I had in reading wildlife studies, you know, I'm a lay person, but occasionally um, I, I like to go deeper than, let's say I go deeper than the hunting literature. So, uh, which is scant as it is. So I might find myself reading, you know, uh, a wildlife study and I just never thought about that component. Like if they say they found this scat, I never really thought like, how do I, how do I know that, is this something that you had heard people talking about 
or has this largely gone un? discussed in the literature? Is it just assumed in the peer review process, for instance, is it just assumed that the observer has the correct scat because many people wouldn't think to even question it? Or or was there awareness that there could be um, significant mistakes? Um, I think all of the above. You know, I mean, different researchers have different levels of aware awareness around this. And I think that um, when it comes to track-based data, so tracks and signs, um, there's sort of two schools of thought. And one is that you absolutely can't tell and therefore there's no use in sort of collecting this data. You know, I've yeah, met right. many land managers that, that say, you know, like there's, there's no way you can tell that, you know. Um, so therefore we don't care about the skill level of trackers because we're just not going to use track based data. We don't believe that it's possible to, to tell anything from that. And then there's all, there are also researchers who, um, think that, you know, you should know the skill level, but it's just, for some reason, it's just not, um, you know, it's not, not mentioned across the literature. And that's with a lot of things, you know, like if you look at camera trapping studies, you know, a lot of, they've started to, but a lot of camera trapping studies, maybe in the beginning, didn't, you know, give their, um, I forget what the term is, but there's a term when, you know, an animal walks, but false triggers, you know, mm -hmm. or things like that, you know, so like you have to know the background of what you're studying in order to present it in your research. And if you're not presenting on tracking, you're presenting on some biological element that you've studied really well, you might not even know that there's this thing called tracking that's right. actually pretty complex, you know, right. because I've had professors who know, who knew that I were, was doing my PhD on the accuracy of tracking in the cyber tracker system come to me and say, yeah, I'm doing a, a, a wildlife survey tomorrow with um, sand track traps. And can you recommend a field guide for me to use to teach my students tracks tomorrow? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Right, right. We're we're building yeah, right. a, we're building a nuclear reactor tomorrow. Do you know a how to guide that could show us how to, <laughs> it's like such a complex thing to imagine learning right. overnight and then teaching? Yeah, yeah. And so they're they're not even aware that they're not aware. <laughs> you know? right. mm -hmm. So yeah. So and I think it's that's the case with a lot of things. You know, it's not just tracking. What would you compare it to? I mean, I would say, you know, maybe a nuclear reactor is a little over the top, but but it's as complex as any learning any language, it seems. Would that, is that fair to say? Yeah, it is a language. It's learning mm -hmm. how to read, you know, the tracks and signs that are on the landscape. You know, I mean, Louis Liebenberg, when he developed the cyber tracker system, and if you read many of his books and his papers, he describes uh, track and sign identification as the ABCs of a language, you know, like of the English language in particular in this case. But, you know, that's the fundamental building blocks of learning tracking. And then by the time you put that into trailing, you're putting together words and sentences and paragraphs, and you're actually reading the stories of the animals that are on the landscape. Could you tell us about the Cyber Tracker program? Because, to, you know, it's something I've heard about for a long time from friends of mine, especially people in like the primitive skills community. I'll hear about it a lot. But it was in watching um, the uh, slideshow that was the defense of your dissertation. I watched that this morning and that's, you, you kind of lay it out there in such a way that I was like, oh, now I really understand what this program is. And um, how, the complexity of the program too was quite stunning to me. Um, and so earning that, you know, senior tracker designation is not a, a small thing, is it? It's uh, quite involved. Heavy yeah, testing it, and whatnot. It really is. And I, in all honesty, never expected to achieve that before I got my PhD. I intended to continue to pursue it until I achieved it, but I never expected to actually get it before my PhD. I thought that that was going to be the much more, you know, time consuming of the two. Um, but yes, wow, I can. That says a lot, doesn't it? Yeah, really. <laughs> wow. I wow. mean, and I'm not saying that the PhD wasn't time consuming because as I said, I lived, you know, my life during that. But um, yeah, it was definitely a shock. So 
Um, yeah, so the second chapter of my dissertation actually describes the Cybertracker system because the research was actually looking at the accuracy and the reliability of people who are certified in that system. So in the 1990s, Louis Liebenberg and Wilson Masia, um, a Shangan tracker from South Africa, developed for, they f developed the first Cybertracker evaluations together. And Cybertracker as an umbrella organization is called Cybertracker Conservation. And their mission statement is to develop a worldwide environmental monitoring network. And there's two sides to that network. There's software that that even non-literate indigenous people can use to collect data for science. And then there's the certification process for trackers. And then the certification process for trackers is divided further into two channels. And one, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, is the track and sign identification and interpretation component. And the other is the trailing component, which is the following of tracks and signs to find an animal. And you have to progressively go up in levels or, you know, like the, the initial system was designed to identify people who were already trackers, who were already still practicing this to try to preserve their skills and perpetuate their skills. So Louis was particularly working with the son in the Kalahari, different family groups, and he was identifying who their best trackers were. And he was trying to go out into the field and, you know, learn from them, allow them to learn from him what they could, and instill in them the importance of mentoring the younger generations in tracking and also provide them with jobs so that they could be gainfully employed as trackers in their environment and not lose these skills. So um, they developed the cyber tracker system to try to identify trackers. And it has turned into here, especially in North America, a fantastic educational system. So while its goal is to certify people that can provide monitoring data worldwide, it's also an educational component. You know, like here in North America, we talk about it being the best workshop that you can take to learn about what's living and moving in your backyard. Um, but the track and sign identification system, the evaluation, you go out into the field with a qualified evaluator and they circle roughly 50 tracks out there of different levels of complexity or signs. And then you, you have to come to your own individual answer. You're not allowed to talk with other people. You're not allowed to use books or rulers or other resources. You go, you look at whatever is in the circle, you come to your own conclusion, and then you go and you either show the evaluator your notebook where you've written it down or you whisper it in their ear. They put that data on a score sheet. And then at the end of a section, which is generally about seven questions or so, they go through and they tell everybody, the 10 people in that evaluation, what the right answer is. And then they go over all of the different answers without singling anybody out, but why that this is a bobcat and not a house cat and mm. not a gray fox. And so you're getting why it is what it is and why it's not what it's not. And it's a tremendous learning opportunity. And it's concrete. It's specific. It's black and white. It's not like, oh, just go figure it out yourself. You know, it's like, right. this is why they show you and they show you photographs and they show you diagrams and they say, you see this asymmetry here. You see this claw mark here. Here, you know, and so it's really, really powerful. Um, and then so somebody who gets qualified between 70 and 79 percent earns a level one. Somebody who gets qualified between 80 and 89 percent earns a level two, 90 to 99 percent earns a level three, and then 100% earns a, what we call a level four or a professional level, because that's supposed to be the industry standard, at least across Africa, where people are employed as trackers to find wildlife in ecotourism. You know, we want somebody who's at least at that standard because they're really capable trackers at that point. 
When I first heard the term cyber tracker, I guess I thought this was like an online program. You know what I mean? Just because of the name, I didn't understand what it meant. Um, and then seeing the rigor of it uh, today, I was like uh, really understood for the first time, I think in a way I hadn't before. Um, also, I just want to say my impression from your uh, the slideshow I watched is that this less people think you're just looking at deer tracks or elk tracks or moose tracks or bison tracks. There's, you know, it's smaller animals, but is it true to say too, that it could be things like invertebrates, um, you know, things that you wouldn't normally necessarily think about the average person wouldn't think about, you know, observing the tracks of. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, so this is one of the things that I think we struggle with. I know I struggle with as an evaluator in South Africa sometimes. We'll get right back to the show in a moment. But first, hunting is as ancient as humanity itself. And through most of our history, it wasn't just a physical pursuit, but it was also a spiritual one. It was one of the ways human beings came to understand ourselves and how to reverently approach the animals that would come to sustain us. Hunting is still an incredible tool for personal transformation, helping you discover more about yourself, your environment, the animals you share the world with, and even helping you develop a deeper understanding of life and death itself. Hunting can help you find your place in the community of life. But you could hunt all your life and never find that kind of transformation. It takes deliberate practice, awareness, and sometimes even initiation. That's why my friend Monsal Denton created sacredhunting.com. Sacred Hunting brings new or experienced hunters out onto the landscape to stalk, harvest, and field dress animals in a retreat-type setting in conjunction with sweat lodges, plant medicine ceremonies, and strong intention setting that prepares hunters for a lifelong spiritual relationship with themselves, the land, and the animals they hunt. Last time I was in Texas for a hunt, Matzel came out to hold ceremony for me as a way of deepening the experience, creating more reverence for the land, and of course, as a way of honoring the animals we'd be harvesting. That's the piece that's so often missing in modern hunting, a piece that many hunters would like to restore. If this is what you're after or you want to learn more, check out sacredhunting.com. Monsell and his team will guide you through beginner hunts and more experienced hunters will find unique opportunities available across the country and globe, like Axis deer hunts on Molokai in Hawaii and even a northern Siberia hunt with the Nenets people coming up in 2022. There's only a few spots available for each hunt, so go to sacredhunting.com and complete their two-minute application. Discounts are available if you let them know you heard about them on the Wild Fed podcast. Again, go to sacredhunting.com and you can learn more about Monsel and Sacred Hunting on episode 59 of the Wild Fed podcast. Now, back to the show. There's this kind of blurry line between what is naturalist knowledge and what you have to know to be a tracker, right? Because invertebrates often can be very informative to how old a trail is. And so they're important to know. The tracks and signs of invertebrates are important to know. Um, bird tracks as well, or some reptiles and amphibians that only move at night, things like that. So it's pretty much anything. I mean, I've been asked and I've asked things like lightning strikes or, you know, what direction is a vehicle moving in, which can be extremely important to anti-poaching, you know? Mm. So, I mean, it's, it's pretty much everything, but what we try to do is at least establish boundaries on what can be asked in an evaluation because it should apply to tracking. So yes, it can be invertebrate questions, you know, just for the sake of like, this is a um, sawfly uthica, which is an egg case or something like that, you know, like because it's published in the tracking literature, you know, all of these field guides that we have that are created by trackers. But when a new field guide comes out, it's a process of a period of years before those things in that book, many of them will never become questions because maybe they're not specific enough to identify. But some of them, if they're specific enough to identify, will be taught for a number of years before they're introduced to the system, usually as a bonus question on evaluation. So those don't they do count for you, but don't count against you. Um, and then, you know, if they continue for a number of years, they will eventually be asked as counting questions. So it's a process. Um, 
Yeah, so it, it's quite complex. And getting back to the name Cyber Tracker, so I actually, in my dissertation defense, uh, I think I actually got that wrong. I think I actually misspoke about where the name came from. And many people have the misperception that the software. Uh, the data collection software came first, and then the tracking evaluation was developed. And it's actually the reverse. I spent a long time on the phone with Louis recently and discovered that I had that backwards in mm. my mind. Yeah. And it logically makes sense that that would occur. But what he said actually happened was they were not developed in time very far apart, but that uh, the name CyberTracker comes from not just the software component of the system, but also because he interviewed a lot of his friends and family at the time trying to find a name for this organization. And they put a bunch of names together. And this was the one that they selected because a cyber was somebody who in the Greek language used to sail the ships. They were the pilot or the navigator of the ships. And they mm. needed to recalculate constantly the course of their ship based on the information that they were getting fed back to them from the environment at the yeah, time. Right. So the waves, the weather, you know, like what did the sky look like, the position of the stars, you know, everything else. And so it was this constant feedback loop where they would get information, set a course, get new information, recalculate the course and set a new course. And that's what tracking does. You know, track and sign, you, t you tell the evaluator your answer. The evaluator either confirms or denies that that is what it is and corrects you, you then know how to move forward, you know where your weak spots are, and you can go for forward and identify, you know, like you can learn, you can fill in those gaps. And with trailing, it's amazing because it's all feedback loops. So, you know, you go out there, you try to identify a fresh trail, maybe you follow it for 50 meters and it fizzles out into nothing. Well, is that because the ground suddenly got really hard there? Or was the ground where you first identified the track a track trap that was going to hold tracks for a long time? And so you're following what you thought was a fresh trail, but it's actually older. So you're constantly revising your hypothesis. And this is what Louis is is actually think, you know, like in his publications, he's stating that the, the art of tracking may well be the origin of science because many of these concepts are based on the same feedback mechanisms that science is based mm -hmm. on, you know? And so our original trackers slash hunters, because that's what tracking was used for, are our original scientists. <laughs> yeah, I really like that. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> and uh, depending on where the track leads, you get to confirm your hypothesis. Absolutely. Uh, well. Absolutely. So that's the ultimate in evidence, isn't it? Um, all right. I want to, that kind of leads me to the next thing I want to ask about, which is, I think probably a lot of the people listening have seen uh, the famous film. Is it called The Great Dance? The Yeah. Okay. So that's looking at the sun persistence hunting. And you, you're you watching people trail in a way that, I mean, it's kind of staggering to the Western mind the first time you see it, you know, the way they're able to stay on, not just the animal track, but on a specific animal. It's really impressive at the speeds that you see them moving, things like that. And, um, you know, it occurs to me that tracking probably originates in Africa since people do. And then, of course, it's a skill carried around the world, as you mentioned, you know, being that hunting is sort of one of the crucial subsistence strategies for people until very recently. So it spreads around the world. And then it kind of appears to me to sort of fade back. And then, except in Africa, where there's still this, you can still have a full-time job as a tracker. That kind of blows my mind a little bit. Could you tell us a little bit about what that is in Africa for folks who aren't familiar with that culture, um, that sort of safari slash hunting culture out there, because the idea of a professional tracker here in North America sounds pretty strange. Yeah. 
I hope that it doesn't remain strange forever because, um, you know, as with anything, in order for it to grow in this world, we need to make sure that people can get jobs in it. You know, like when I was a teacher at university, one of the questions that people always used to ask me, especially parents, are what kind of jobs can my child get if they graduate with this degree? Mm -hmm. You know, so it's an important aspect to consider. And across much of Africa, the safari industry for ecotourism exists. I'm not familiar as much with the hunting industry in South Africa, but my partner and I work in ecotourism and we train entry level guides and we train trackers. And there is an entire industry built, built around reserves, parks, reserves, and lodges. And within those lodges, there are usually guide and tracker teams. And the guide drives a vehicle and the tracker sits on a little seat on the hood of the vehicle or the bonnet, as they call it there. And they track, they identify the fresh trails of animals from a moving vehicle and then if they see something like a rhinoceros trail, they'll jump off the vehicle, you, the guide will stop the car, and then they'll jump off the vehicle and they'll make sure that it's fresh. They'll maybe drive around the next block to make sure it didn't come out of that block, but then they'll start trailing the animal when it doesn't come out of a block until they find it. And they'll radio back to the guide and say, hey, I've found the rhino. It's sleeping underneath the big marula on the western ridge of, you know, like Shamban Plains or something like that. And so the guide will then drive the guests in so that they can view the rhino and they can photograph the rhino. Rhino, and there's this huge safari industry that's built all around that. And of course, the better your trackers are, the more success you're going to have as a lodge in showing your guests unique, rare, spectacular wildlife. And so that's, you know, there's this whole industry that's built around that and the reputations of lodges, you know, for having Good, good trackers, trackers. Yeah. yeah yeah is important where does this okay so um i'm gonna just say a bunch of word salad and if you can pick out the question <laughs> in here so you've got this piece where you have indigenous trackers i'm assuming bringing traditional knowledge like in other words they probably haven't spent their life reading field guides on tracking and going to tom brown wilderness classes or something they they're bringing this knowledge from their communities i'd assume and then um then there's folks like yourself, though, who have, you know, raised here in the West and then trained in this. Um, how do those two skill sets compare? One of the things that kind of surprised me in the video I watched today is you were talking about um, the, the you were comparing the uh, like how frequently people were correct or incorrect based on, you know, their level uh, in cyber tracker, or also you had a category, I think, for uh, indigenous knowledge as well. And I was kind of surprised by those results. And so I was wondering if you could kind of explain, you know, what do the, is, is everybody employed as a full-time tracker um, come from an indigenous community or is it mixed? And then what do they do really well? And then what do Western trained trackers do really well? And how do those skill sets compare? Um, and then ultimately, I guess, really like, could you confirm for me too, for the folks who are professional trackers from indigenous backgrounds, is that knowledge that they have come from from hunting essentially? Is that is that why they have that knowledge in the first place? Okay, or, that was those were a lot of questions. So you might you you're might have to remind you're gonna me. Follow, you're going to follow that trail of work. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Um, one of the variables that I did explore was indigenous. And, um, you know, what, what I found was that it really comes down to experience. You know, it comes down to experience tracking. And if you live in an indigenous community that is still practicing tracking, chances are you have experience. If you don't come from a community that practices tracking, you don't have experience as much experience, you know, like you only have as much as when you started, you know, and um, in many communities in South Africa. Uh, so 
typically it is only indigenous people who are hired as trackers for lodges and reserves in South Africa. Um, much of Africa, in fact, uh, People will be hired who are from non-Indigenous communities to do things like anti-poaching, but typically in the lodges, I've never seen anybody other than a, a basically an Indigenous man as a tracker. It's very rare even to find women. Um, and they grow up or they previously grew up in communities where they were learning tracking from an agro pastoralist perspective because they were not allowed to hunt even uh. you know it it it's kind of similar to here in North America where native peoples were pushed onto reservations it's very similar to that there and so they may have been pushed onto marginalized lands and then if they're on a park land just like with the sun in parts of the Kalahari they're no longer allowed to hunt there because it's a park some poaching some snaring does occur and you know you can definitely gain a real depth of knowledge from doing that and a lot of the anti-poaching teams that are formed in South Africa have ex poachers on them because if you want to catch a poacher <laughs> the best way to yeah. is to hire a poacher you know and it's like trappers here in north america they have some of the best you know tracking and naturalist skills out of anybody but um so they and, and then the other half of that is that most children they used to grow up herding the family's goats or the family's cattle. And so, you know, instead of going to school, that's what they did. And they go out on the land all day and they'd make sure that the cows stayed together. And if they came home at the end of the night and one of the cows were missing, they were in trouble and they had to go back out and they had to find that cow. Or if a lion got out of the park and came into their community and, you know, they had to be able to recognize the tracks and be able to say, okay, we need to go and find the cattle and make sure that they're okay. So a lot of, you know, the original tracking skills were based on time and effort, and they were also based on food and safety. And so these are the people that, in, in all honesty, in more modern days, as we progress in time here, fewer and fewer children in these indigenous communities are performing the functions of herders. Their parents much prefer, now that the opportunity is there, for them to go to school. They want their children to become accountants and doctors and lawyers and engineers. And if you go into any school and you ask the children there, what do you want to be when you grow up? Nobody says a tracker, you know? Right, right. So there's this... Um, you know, sort of disconnect, you know, like there's, there's not a lot of the younger generation that is growing up tracking, you know, in these indigenous communities. And so it's become less of where people come from a culture that tracks, you know, and they're forming a culture. Like when I say a culture of tracking, it's like we're drawing from cultures all over the world of people who are just gravitating towards tracking as something to do beyond that of an occupation, beyond that of something for food or for safety. Especially here in North America, there's a big movement of trackers who just like tracking because it's fun. It's weird. You, know, so you would be like you. You would have tracking emerge at the lowest rung of the Maslow hierarchy of needs, for instance, where it's like, I have to eat, I have to survive, therefore I learn this skill be out of necessity. And then it goes dormant till you get to like the top of that hierarchy of needs, which is like, I'm so affluent, it's self-actualization time. And this is what I like doing as a hobby because all my needs are met. It's just kind of a fascinating, you know, these two bookends, I guess, yes. that you can see, you know, it's really interesting. Like somebody who's like, my life is so set up now and I come from such an affluent culture. I can pursue this track of learning because it, it's just fun for me. I just, there's something really neat and strange about that at the same time. 
Yeah, I agree. Um, I don't know if, you know, I mean, certain, certainly the people here in North America are definitely more affluent than the cultures we're talking about. Um, but I also don't know, like when I think of trackers and I think of people who run in wilderness schools or participate in wilderness schools, I don't see a high level of comfort or, you know, um, by choice, success. Though, you by know? Of, by yeah, it's, them, there's you sort know? yeah, there's sort of this <laughs> perception that, you know, if you make money from this, then you're not doing it right. I don't know. But um, yeah, so, you know, trackers don't tend to be people who have money, but we certainly have a lot more money and a lot more resources and a lot more of a foundation to build off of from that Maslow's hierarchy of needs that you're talking about than a lot of indigenous cultures. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I guess here in the West, we have the ability to um, <clears throat> shrug off our affluence be, and then yeah. choose another route because of how we, you know, it's, but it's like, it's available at any time, even if you're homeless here in the United States, it's like, there's so many resources here, you know, that you have. And I find that part actually interesting too, because since you kind of brought it up, um, one of the questions that I've had for folks over the years, and I'm curious your perception on this is like, so as somebody who hunts, um, I mean, I'm in the, I'm so similar in this. It's like I hunt for subsistence, but I'm affluent enough not to need to. So it's like this weird thing. I do it because I enjoy it. Um, but not cause I, I wouldn't eat otherwise, but it's like, I've chosen to live that way. Um, so as somebody who hunts in the modern world for food, but has very, very limited tracking skills, Almost everyone that I meet with really good tracking skills rarely hunts. Many of the people I know who are trackers have hunted, hunt occasionally, but that's not why they track. And so I had a friend uh, who was talking to me about, you know, he was pursuing tracking in a much more serious way. And I said, oh, are you going to start hunting? And he's like, no, <laughs> he just wants to track. <laughs> You know, and I was like, man, you'd be so good with these skills. So I want to ask you your perception of that too, because most of the modern hunting culture here in the West, you know, tracking is not, I don't know, I don't know why, I mean, in limited capacity. So, you know, I know you're from Connecticut, I'm from Maine. So, you know, when you go into Northern Maine, there's a style of hunting they call tracking where, you know, you, it's mostly done in the snow and muzzle loader season and you sort of stay on a buck and till you, till you, you know, trail them till you get to them. Um, so that's a thing that people do, but you know, by and large, it's just not a huge part of what hunting is anymore today here in the West. So I'm curious your thoughts on that disconnect because, you know, some of the trackers that I've met, you know, they're deeply immersed in, in the whole suite of kind of earth skills or, or I don't know what you want to call them, primitive skills where it's like, they don't want to hunt till they've made their own buckskin outfit and their own self bow. And they, you know, they want to make everything. And when it's all done and they have all the skills, now they're going to finally put it together and hunt versus like the modern hunter here in the West, which is like, I'm, they get to through technology, you know, sort of jump ahead all the way to the pursuit of game part and never really need to learn to track. So again, kind of a word salad, not really a question in there, but what's going on with that <laughs> connect between the hunting world and the tracking world because they they were uh, co-joined skills at one point, and now they sort of exist in s sort of barely overlapping, you know, kind of what's the word there for those overlap charts? There, the two spheres. They oh, they can, the Venn diagrams. Yeah, the, the, the Is that Venn what they are? Venn diagram overlap, yeah. where you do have some folks who do both, but typically, uh, I don't know if you've seen that too. They tend to be sort of separate spheres. Yeah, um, I do see that, um, and I tend to call those you know, what other people call primitive living skills or bushcraft. I do sometimes call them bushcraft, but I, I call them original wisdom. And mm -hmm. I call them, I call tracking original wisdom because these are skills that are both ancient, that come from the roots of humanity, of all of our cultures. And they are also, you know, they include pushing forward into the modern world and gaining tracking knowledge or, you know, woods knowledge, naturalist knowledge, ecological knowledge through mechanisms of science, right? So original in both plays of the world where it's ancient and it's new and it's all wisdom. Original so like I, novel and original like ancient, right? It's That's really right. powerful to, I, I'd never really thought of that before, but that's, that's actually a really kind of powerful revelation mentally for me to think of it that way. Nice. Yeah. And so I don't, I do see the disconnect that you're talking about. Um, 
the older I get, the more I roam around the world and in this field, the more overlap I do see between hunters and trackers. But for the most part, I do see the disparity that you're talking about. And I guess I can only speak from my own perspective, and that might be very different from somebody else's. But from my perspective, I used to hunt. And when I started to get really good at trailing, which is the other aspect of the evaluations that we got sidetracked and didn't talk about, we talked about the track and sign, but then there's this whole other side of it called the trailing, which is, you know, once you're able to identify the tracks and signs of animals, you follow and you find them. And it's on the same sliding scale or um, hierarchical scale as the track and sign evaluations where you go up in levels from one, two, three professional and uh, then you are invited to a specialist level evaluation where you work soft-footed animals. So um, your skill increases. And when I started to get good at trailing and understand that when I talk about getting good at trailing, I make no mistake that I can still lose the trail and the San Bushmen still, you know, or San Peoples, I'm sorry, still lose the trail, you know, like these, everybody loses the trail. I've seen master trackers lose the trail. And, you know, so when I say I, I'm getting good, it just means that, you know, I'm, I'm able to more consistently follow and find animals, but there's always more to learn. Uh, but when I started to get good and I was following the animals around the deer outside my house, um, I started to get to be able to read their trails and identify them as individuals. Hmm. And the last time that I went out hunting I was following the trail of an orphaned fawn. She had been orphaned in the spring and she was going into the winter and I was following her trail and I just ended up leaning my rifle against a tree and just going and, and following her for the rest of the day because I knew who she was. Right, right. You know, and it was like at that point I could no longer shoot her. I really needed to think about that, you know, because I was like, this is my friend. This is my family mm. member, you know, and that to me, it it's very contradictory because in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, but in my opinion, you should have a personal relationship with an animal if you're going to take its life. And yeah. I, you know, like, but I couldn't get beyond that step. And I did go back to my house after retrieving my rifle that day. And I thought about it for a while. And I said, you know, of all of the animals in this patch of woods, she's probably got the least chance of making it through the winter because she didn't look good. She looked thin and her coat was patchy. And I said, you know, maybe I should take her because it's better for her to, you know, perhaps die quickly without suffering. And, you know, it'll be food for my family. And, you know, so it'll make the place, it'll make the ecosystem better and it'll be better for all of us. And so I made the conscious decision to go out and hunt her. And then one morning we had a small skiff of snow and I went out, I set out to hunt her and I ended up following her trail, which turned into a trail with coyotes crossing it. And then it turned into a blood trail. Oh, and then wow. I found her carcass. And the coyotes had fed her and kept the circle of life going in that direction. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that was the last time that I hunted. And like I said, I think that I'll probably go back to it. You know, I was inspired to think about it again when you were talking about squirrel hunting and um, I'm looking out the door, you know, at my house here in Connecticut and I'm seeing like lots of squirrels and I'm going, there's too many squirrels, you know? And so to make the ecosystem a better place, definitely I think some of the squirrels need to be removed. Um, but, you know, again, I have a personal relationship with squirrels where I was a wildlife rehabber for 20 years in North America. And I raised so many damn squirrels that it was like, I, <laughs> when I look at a squirrel, I can actually feel its little body in my hand and its heart beating, you know? You and know, it's like, you don't see those fat <laughs> hams on the back legs where you're like, mm, yeah, right. Like, <laughs> right. Like, like little drumsticks. <laughs> yeah. 
but but I was like I've been thinking about it, you know, and then talking with Cal and Sandy Reed, who you know work for my company, um, you know, like they they're hunting squirrels, they're hunting small game and stuff, and I'm like, okay, I recognize the need, and so the need may drive me back to it, the need to make sure that this ecosystem is in balance, especially if we, you know, like as people, we tend to remove all of the top carnivores, so then the what's left here are like people and cars as predators, you know? And so, you know, (laughs) there's a real need for that. But so that's my, my sort of position on it, but I don't know why other people, you know, might choose to keep them, them separate. I think there's a real value in like you, I love to read, you know, the hunting literature and the science literature and, you know, the popular literature. And, you know, I watch documentaries on, on you know, my computer and everything. I don't have a television, but, um, you know, like I, I, there's a, I read as a child a book and it was on Arthurian mythology. And there was a quote that was probably fictional, but it was attributed to Merlin. And he said, Never turn aside from the knowing, however the knowing may come. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's like the way that I live my life. You know, I want to know as much as possible. And I don't think that, you know, you need to learn everything out on your own in the forest because those books and those television programs and those teachers can push your learning forward much more quickly than you could if you spent a lifetime out there trying to learn it on your own. So it's almost like you're, these books and these other resources are shortcuts to learning. Mm. And you can learn something even from people that you don't agree with because we learn who we are by learning who we are not. So, you know, I'm, I just think that you can learn from everything. Uh, there's there's a lot of wisdom in all those things you just said. Uh, that thing you just said too re- harkens back to what you said earlier about a track, where it's like, here's why it's this track, and here's why it's not this track. That I never really thought about that, but you do learn a lot about yourself by finding out what you aren't. That's uh, really powerful. So thanks for that share. And um, I I want to say just a, a riff off what you were talking about. As somebody who came to hunting pretty late in life, I don't have you know, 40 years of deer hunting skill and background and and experiences and failures and successes and all those things to draw upon. So, um, I have to be, I have to use my, um, I guess, you know, other, I draw on other experiences to get me there, um, to be be successful and I'm successful enough to eat deer when I want to eat deer. But, uh, you know, I just don't have this strong skill set brought up from my childhood. So I'll, and the other thing is because I'm, uh, interested in nutrition, I recognize that older animals, um, have had more time to bioaccumulate the toxins that are on the environment because of industry. So I am not somebody who's like, Ooh, look at that mature seven year old buck with the huge rack. I want to eat him. It's like that dude's liver has been processing, you know, pesticides for seven years. Like I'd rather eat that yearling or that younger animal, but I get made fun of a lot by hunters who uh, pursue game partially because of the challenge. And so they're looking for that older animal and they'll, this is all going to come around now to make sense why I'm bringing this up is somebody who's got a thing for a certain buck, let's say, and he's chasing that specific buck. And they'll make fun of me for like shooting a younger animal. And I always think, man, I think it's a little weird to, it's like, do you have something personal? (laughs) You want to kill this specific animal? Like to me, that's almost like I get a little cringed by that. Uh, I don't know how to say it. I'm not judging it because I'll do the same thing occasionally, but it's like, it's like almost like uh, you were saying before, you've developed a personal relationship with that fawn and that makes you kind of not want to kill them. And so the idea of like, no, I want to kill that specific one. It's like, ooh, that's almost like a grudge or something. I'd rather not know, like be a little more um, anonymous in it. Uh, so that's one of the things that kind of freaks me out about tracking is like knowing too much. <laughs> will, will that same yeah. thing happen to me, you know? Yeah, um, it's totally possible. I mean, you want to talk about nature connection, you know, like we, you know, this has become a huge thing these days is, you know, connecting with self and others and land, including the others that live on that land that are non-human, you know, and there's nothing like tracking, which to me, a lot of people in North America, when they say tracking, 
tracking, they're talking about track and sign because that's the major component that seems to be spreading more quickly here. But to me, tracking and to Louis and to, you know, the original people who developed CyberTracker and, you know, promoted CyberTracker, tracking is the combination of the track and sign and the trailing because mm -hmm. you're not really tracking until you're combining all of that information and following and finding. You can be a great naturalist, but that changes to being a tracker once you are following a trail, right? Right. So that's, that's sort of the definition of tracking. And, um, you know, I don't know if you've read, there's a, a, a whole bunch of books by an author called um, David Peterson. He's got Racks and um, A Hunter's Heart and I think Elk Heart. And, and he really speaks eloquently to, you know, this philosophy of taking meat, you know, where, when you need meat and that you can be selective, even if you are being selective on younger animals, you can be selective and look for a larger animal. And there's this drive, I think in people, you know, it's the same drive that we see it amongst the animal community. It's like, you know, this all harkens back to, you know, evolution where, you know, the best hunters were the most successful hunters. But then imagine if you were a hunter and you could bring back a bigger animal mm -hmm. that could right. feed more of your people, of you know? And I mean, so I think it's all intertwined, you know, like these are evolutionary aspects that we're looking at right. and we don't need to hunt the animals with the biggest racks now, for example. And it's better if we leave them in the environment, at least until they can reproduce, which doesn't tend to be between anywhere between seven and nine years of age, you know, depending on species. So it's better if we can do that. That. Um, you know, and then I think too about what your comment about bioaccumulation. I read a, a post um, recently on Instagram on uh, in, an indigenous woman's post who does a lot of gathering, and she said that um, she goes out and she gathers, and she even gathers on roadsides because if she thinks about it, the stuff that we have the ability to buy in supermarkets is coated usually with pesticides or herbicides or something anyway. And so really, how bad can it be to harvest from a roadside? You know, like, Either way, we're, we're, you know, like we're getting the nutrients that are involved from the sun and the local, local ecosystem and stuff like that. And while I'm not advocating for people to go out and start gathering everything from roadsides, I'm just try, like that was a perspective shift for me because I was like, huh, oh, yeah, you know, like these animals out here, even if they are consuming plants that have chemicals in them, you know, bioaccumulation, as you say, it's probably better, if not the same, as what we get in the grocery store. And we strive for better. Uh, it's but interesting because it's also, though, like, for instance, in Maine here, uh, well, first, I want to say I understand that perspective, um, and I sort of share it to a degree. Uh, but also, like, here where we have cadmium fallout, let's say, from our paper mills in Maine, and so, you know, the department puts out a thing every year saying, hey, don't eat your whitetail livers, and if you do you know, whatever, one meal per however often. Um, okay. Whereas, um, let's say, now that's that's a generic deer they're talking about. But if there's cadmium in the, in it bioaccumulates in the liver, you know, that really mature animal is going to have a lot more of it than that younger animal is going to have. Um, and then, but the other thing is, is like if we go and we get a, a, a deer from a venison farm or we go get a cow, I mean, that animal's one year old, two years old. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Versus like we don't usually, you know, you don't get a 20 year old chicken ever when you go to the store to buy a chicken. I mean, there's, you know, right. You know what I mean? They're always going to be first year, second year animals, whether they're pigs or, and then hunting is so different. And like, but like you were saying, I mean, not only would that bigger animal feed more people, but that rack was all resources, right? Like for napping right. flint or whatever. It's like, you know, I mean, I find all this really fascinating because we're like, we're dealing with new influences, like toxins in the environment. And then we're dealing with you know, old influences, all this evolutionary stuff you're talking about. And then the other thing is, is like that, th that thing you were talking about a moment ago about people wanting to have more connection. There's a part of me that's like, that is my environment. Like 
there's Roundup Ready in my environment. So it's going to be in my body regardless, you know, whether right. I eat those things or not. But I, at the same time, it's hard to know if 20 minutes before you started foraging, if they came by and did an application of glyphosate for, you know, to the roadside right before you started picking too, which you wouldn't get from the corn you buy because it can only be applied at certain times during the growing cycle to protect the consumer. So it's so much more complicated than the than 15,000 years ago or whatever. Um, Absolutely. There's a lot there yeah. to, to pick apart. But um, for me, the one thing I can see when I'm out is that um, the, my lack of tracking skills is impacting me going where I want to go as a hunter. Um, hmm. And I wanted to ask, I, 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 you know, there's times where it doesn't really matter at all. And then there's times where it definitely does. And, uh, you know, I was recently, and when I watch what my dog is capable of, you know, oh with goodness. her nose. Oh my goodness. Right now it's funny. Cause I'll watch my dog get confused about which way is the animal going, you know, uh -huh. I'll be looking at the track pointing one way and see her run it backward for a little while before she figures it out, you know, and I can just visually see that. Um, it, my track identification is not too bad, but the trailing piece is where it would, I feel be most useful to me. Where do you tell people to start? Cause this stuff is like, it's at first you think, oh yeah, you get one of those, one of those identification books and you just learn it like that. And then you realize, oh, this is a very <laughs> complex science. Where do you go uh, to, to begin? Where do you recommend people start? Um, well, I recommend that you start with looking at the ground every day. <laughs> yeah. um, because the biggest part of trailing, of being able to trail successfully is getting 10,000 images of the way that deer tracks look in different substrates, in dappled lighting, during different behaviors. Um, and they, you know, like it, it, it surprises people when they go out on a trailing workshop with me and I point to a deer track in leaf litter and they say, wait, where? Mm. Because they don't see it. You know, they're used to seeing the perfect textbook image of a deer track, usually in sand or soil. And they don't, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's, you know, they don't, they just don't realize that there are 10 gazillion different presentations of any mm. animal's tracks. And as you get higher, even in the track and sign identification, you're able to identify partial tracks and tracks in different substrates and during different behaviors. And what you're doing when you follow an animal is you're seeing 10 billion different tracks in different circumstances. And you have to get you know, like when you're on a trail, if you, I look up and I see the leaf litter is changing here from oak maple to beach. I'm already lifting my eyes and looking ahead along the most obvious route, searching for any kind of sign up ahead because those beach leaves compress much more thickly and easily than the oak maple. And I can get a clear trail through the oak maple, but it all but disappears in the uh, beech leaves. Mm. And so I'm already knowing my sight picture is going to change. And so as I'm moving forward, I'm anticipating that and I'm looking up and I am slowing down because I know my eyes are going to have to adjust to a new sight picture. And it's the same when I move from shade to sunlight or sunlight to shade, you know, it's, it's a new sight picture. So going out and looking at the ground every day and following a trail maybe for a little ways, whether it's 30 meters or, you know, five miles, you know, I mean, get just getting those different images, starting to get them in your head, reading about deer behavior and, you know, like anticipating where are they going to bed? Where are they going to go to feed at this time of the year? I, I, you know, going along with the nature connection piece that you're talking about, you know, you get to know the individuals in your area. You know what they're feeding on at different times of the year and you, you go there and that's where you pick up the fresh trails. But the thing is, is that this aging piece, so it's not just the images, the 10,000 different images, it's the track aging. Mm. Track aging is a huge science in and of itself. And if you don't get good at recognizing when a trail is fresh, everything else falls apart because 
you won't really be successful on older trails. Sometimes you can follow an older trail and maybe the animal bedded down several times and you catch up with it. But generally, older trails are really hard to follow. And so you end up losing them. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you can identify a fresh trail, you're going to be successful in your practice. And if you're successful in your practice, it gives you a certain exhilaration to keep going, to keep practicing. So if you go outside and you look at the ground every day and you put a track outside your door in just like scuff up some dirt outside your doorway and you put your own track in that area every day. And then as you're walking out the door every day to go to work or school or the library or hunting or whatever, you just look down at that track and you say, huh, my track from yesterday looks older and you carry on. And then the next day it's okay. I see my tracks from the last two days, or maybe they get wiped out by rain, but you see that and you're like, okay, now I have a baseline to go from because it has rained. Are there raindrops in the track or is the track on top of them? Mm -hmm. You know, so the track aging piece, everybody wants to move right into following and finding because it's sexy and, you know, but, but the track aging piece is the foundation for trailing. You were talking about, uh, well, that aging piece is um, fascinating, obviously, so I I would like to come back to it. But um, the part about looking down at the ground and sort of looking up makes me think of something I heard you saying in an interview I was watching. And you were talking about Africa versus being back home in New England. And here uh, where I am, I mean, I can just keep my head down all day and walk around the woods. Like, I don't really need to look up all that often for us from a safety perspective because there's just not really predators on the landscape. Um, this stuff must just be exhilarating in Africa where you have the potential to encounter so much exotic wildlife compared to what you grew up around. Yeah, it does add a whole nother level of intensity as far as <laughs> your yeah. <laughs> your own personal safety and that right. of the people that are with you. Yeah. Um, but I don't, I don't treat the woods here any differently right. because if you are tracking something, then your potential to run into it is real. And your potential to run into other animals that give you away is also real. So... You know, I, I, I don't treat the woods any differently than I do the African savannas. When, when you were saying earlier, you were talking about the value of <clears throat> invertebrates uh, sometimes in identifying track age. Um, I was just wondering if you could tie that back since we're talking about, you were talking about, you know, the erosive force of rain or weather, um, obviously humidity, things like that are going to affect a track and, and, um, And in some case, help you determine, hey, was this animal here before that that rain that I remember from yesterday afternoon or did it happen after? Um, What are some of the other ways that you were like, uh, how could an invertebrate, for instance, help us with that? Yeah, well, it's just it's as simple as it's much clearer in all honesty in South Africa or in Africa than it is here in North America, because um, I just see a lot more evidence of invertebrates moving on the ground there than I uh, do here. Okay, gotcha. um, so, you know, you know when a specific species of invertebrate only moves at night or only moves in the morning, like scorpions tend to only move at night. So if you see a scorpion trail crossing a lion trail and it's on top, then you know that the lions came through either before the night or during the night, you know? So it's much clearer. That piece is much clearer clearer in South Africa than it is here in North America. Got it. <clears throat> and then I had seen that you were, cause I think you just mentioned you were in Wisconsin recently and you were doing this work with, you know, ungulates there. And I was like, Oh man, I wish I could have been, you know, at a course like that. Um, and then I see you do a lot of work in Africa. Um, but when you're here, how does somebody work with you on that? I mean, I would just love to get into one of your classes and, and, you know, get, get, I guess, an, an immersive experience in this. I think hunting gives me, um, I get the opportunity to observe a lot of tracks. What I don't have is the opportunity to have somebody talk to me about what I'm seeing. So I, I'm sure that there are times where I arrive at really false conclusions, like probably most of the time. Uh, like, tell me about uh, your workshops and like, how do you get into one of those? 
Yeah. So I don't do a lot of them a year. Like I've done three of them in the past month and a half here in North America. And they tend to be about three days and they directly precede trailing evaluations. So people can get some experience practicing and looking at the substrate in that environment before they're evaluated. And that sort of ties in with my philosophy that even when um, the Shangan trackers came over here in, I think it was 2006 with Mark Elbrock, who's our initial evaluator in CyberTracker here in North America, he established the system here with Louis and Adrian Lowe. Um, so what I heard from them was that it took them about three days to get used to the substrate and the environment here before they felt they could follow and find reliably. Wow. And so I like to spend some time both for my students and for me, if I'm going to be evaluating them, I want to know that I can follow the trail in that environment. Um, so I have a calendar on my website, which is originalwisdom.com, and I also use social media. So we have an Original Wisdom Facebook page, and my handle on uh, Instagram is tracking as Original Wisdom. And, you know, I tend to put it out there in those places that when I'm going to do a workshop and when I'm going to do an evaluation, and all of the evaluations for North America are posted on the Tracker Certification North America website. So if you just wanted to do an evaluation, you could certainly do that. And the other way is that, you know, you email me, cursey at originalwisdom.com, and you say, I have a couple of people that want to do a trailing workshop, and I, I come I to you. That. I have that. How many people do I need? <laughs> <laughs> well, you and three others. Okay. So, I mean, Got basically, it. you know, and if, if Lee comes with me, if my partner comes with me, we take double that amount because he's also a senior tracker, and he also evaluates in Africa on both track and sign and trailing, and he's a heck of a good tracker. So, if he comes with me, he also jumps in on the workshops and we can take twice as many people. Got it. Because, uh, yeah, I just feel like this is something that um, a lot of the folks I know would, it's just not, um, how do I put it? Very often because of that sort of Venn diagram I was talking about in the world of hunting, we don't get exposed very often to um, people in the tracking world. Uh, so it's not something people even know. Most of the people I know who hunt don't even realize this is something that they could pursue. And then I do just because I have kind of a foot in both worlds a little bit. But, um, you know, I, I often find that the people who are deep in the tracking world aren't necessarily interested in helping me hunt a lot of the time. So uh, it's just this funny thing I've encountered, but I'd really love to uh, go deeper on this. And it it leads me to kind of this concluding question, which is like, what's the... What's the role of tracking in, in the future? This is such an ancient fundamental part of who we are. And as you mentioned, you know, sort of our original science. Um, and yet, you know, outside of Africa, it's like there isn't really a professional context. How do you see it? Where, where do you vision it over the next, you know, decade, 50 years, 100 years, 1,000 years? Like what role does this play for people as we, you know, continue to move in towards like a sort of transhuman, you know, transnatural world where we're not really um, needing these skills like in the same way that we used to. Yeah, geez, I wish I had a crystal ball. Um, <laughs> I wish you did too. <laughs> yeah, because um, I really don't know the full answer to that question. I know that I would like to see more validation for these, you know, tracking skills as valid skills that can be learned and that can give us reliable information. And I know that one of our senior tracker slash evaluators here in North America, Dave Moskowitz, is currently doing a study on wolverine tracks up oh, in cool. um, Canada. And so he's looking at, I noticed in my dissertation, reviewing the literature that a number of papers cite Wolverine tracks, you know, as their study species, they were they were collecting data based on tracks of Wolverine to determine how many of them were in an area. Because they're so hard to spot and see, basically, you end up relying yeah. on the tracks. And it's usually in snow, you know, so and the people who were spotting the tracks were all f often biologists and pilots, and they were spotting them from the air. Because it's stated in those papers that y Wolverines have a very characteristic track pattern that is unmistakable with anything else. It cannot be mistaken for anything else. And I look at that and I go, 
okay, you know, like, yes, they have a very distinct track pattern. Yes, it might be possible to do this. But here you have a biologist who does not necessarily have any training with tracks. And he's or she's a pilot. So moving at speed in the air, you know, so again, it, this goes back to what is the quality of that data. And so Dave is looking at this with a team of researchers in Canada and putting forth, I think it's a hundred questions. There's a hundred photographs or series of photographs because some of them might be two or three photographs showing like a close up and the track pattern and stuff like that. And he's asking people of different tracker certification, biology, you know, like all across a wide spectrum of qualifications to answer from these photographs on a scale of one to four with four being the most rigorous, like this is a Wolverine and number one being this is not a Wolverine, answer this series of questions, right? So here we're starting to look back at the data that's been collected that has influenced the wildlife management decisions in North America. And we're starting to say, huh, I wonder how valid that actually is. Mm -hmm. And I think that tracking, I, my hope is that tracking will continue to be able to provide more rigor to future studies. But it's almost like we kind of have to bring it back and make people realize that tracking is a thing. And just because you're a fur bearer biologist does not necessarily mean that <laughs> right. you're looking at mm -hmm. the tracks of your, you know, your study species. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, my, my hope is that it will move forward in science with more rigor. More scientists will recognize this as a valid tool in the toolbox of skills that they can provide to their students and their researchers. You know, it's not just, it's not the tool. It doesn't have to be disassociated with things like GPS collars or camera traps or, you know, things. It can help to co-inform them. And it can provide us with a mechanism to have people employed as trackers yeah you know right and that's the big thing is employment you know like we need to find a way to make this as an employable skills which means that we need to create jobs around it well well first that's there's something cool there for me because like i was mentioning my friend before and uh he was you know going so deep into tracking and i was kind of like where is this going for you you know just as an outsider your friend like where are you, where are you going with this like career wise you know uh because he's putting so much time into it and and it's it would be so amazing if there was a career track or where if it was like a thing where you could you know if biologists going to the field had trackers with them the way that you know the guides do in africa you're talking about or you know some kind of context like that would be amazing and just this thing that you want to see, not just stay alive, but the culture around it really flourishing. Uh, though, although it does seem like there's a bit of a renaissance around it right now. Would you say that? Yeah, I think it's growing. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I've uh, really appreciated uh, chatting with you about this. It's like, it gets me really excited. I think you'll be hearing from me about potentially putting a little private workshop together because uh, I'd that love would to be have awesome. you out. Any, uh, anywhere else you want to send people? Anything else you want to let people know about uh, with regard to your work or your workshops or anything like that? Um, yeah. So you probably, I'm not sure where you got the Maybe you got the link to my dissertation and my presentation for my dissertation. That uh, I have two websites. One is the originalwisdom.com, and then the other is trackermentoring.com. And under the, I think it's about tracker mentoring page, you can find a link to my presentation. It's about 46 minutes, I think. And also to my full dissertation and my previous master's work and stuff like that. So if people are interested, they can find out more there. And there's also an online course where we use South African examples but it's applicable to anybody in the world, really. And we have a private Facebook group attached to that course where people from all over the world, you know, like we have one woman who's in the French Alps and we have a guy up in Switzerland. We have people in Tasmania and, you know, Australia. And I mean, it's cool. Sometimes like they'll post wombat tracks and things. And <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's amazing. So, and, and it's about the process of tracking. It's an introductory 
process to both tracks and signs and trailing. And there's a lot of the history that's incorporated into the course of Cyber Tracker and how to get started and even simple things such as how do I photograph tracks in order to ask people for help? Mm. Because the better you can take your pictures, the more standardized those pictures can be, the more help they can provide you. And so it's not just about the tracking and sign component though, it's also about trailing. There's some exercises in there, emphasis on looking at the ground, you know, getting started with it, doing what I call a 10 minute walk every day, looking at the ground. Um, so there's a lot of real fundamental pieces and we'll be putting other courses, uh, correspondence type online courses on there over time on both probably uh, African and North American species. Cool. So there's that as a resource. And I mean, I encourage anybody who's really interested if they want to email me or they want to, you know, message me on social media or whatever. I'm always available. I, I love to build community and make friends. So that's yeah that's really that's an awesome gesture um well you'll be hearing from me thank you so much for your time today and uh, are you headed back to africa pretty soon i am leaving on saturday back cool. for africa yeah wow and it's summer there oh. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a great season out there and uh yeah. safe travels and again thanks for your time today and for sharing your expertise with us Thank you so much for having me. It's been a real pleasure, pleasure, and I hope that I do hear from you and see you again. Thanks for listening to the Wild Fed Podcast. Help us grow this show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. If you still haven't seen season one of the Wild Fed TV show, you can go to myoutdoortv.com, grab yourself a free trial subscription, and then check out all 10 episodes. Season two of Wild Fed premieres on Outdoor Channel in early 2022. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out our store for Wild Fed hats, stickers, and more. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.